Oh, um, everyone who's not want to talk, who doesn't want to talk about post privacy, but wants to hear about burn, Burning Man, should probably head out of this room right now. Um, so we're going to talk about post privacy um, first, if this thing works. It never does. Um, I can tell you what's on the first slide anyways. Uh, my name is uh, Jürgen Goiter or Tante, depends on uh, whether I'm online or offline. Okay. I come from Germany, which is this weird country that brought you Club Mate, which some of you might have enjoyed here. It's probably one of the few good things that Germany has ever produced. Um, the fact that I come from Germany obviously, obviously is going to influence some of the examples I'm going to give you, uh, but those should apply to basically every uh, democratic country on this planet. Again, I um, should excuse my, uh, I, no, I want to ask you to excuse my slightly bad English. Um, obviously, I'm a little bit nervous and uh, I don't have as much practice in it as I'd like to have, so bear with me. And if anything is really unclear, uh, ask real discussion I want to push back uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, I'm a scientist at a German university, a tiny one nobody's ever heard of, but I'm not talking uh, for my employer here. Uh, I study computer science and philosophy and spend a lot of my free time, as limited as it, as it is, thinking about our lives as network beings that involves things like how we relate, relate to privacy, digital ethics in general, and all those kinds of things. A quick disclaimer beforehand, we are speaking about democratic societies here. We're talking about countries like the US, maybe, or most countries in Europe. We're not talking about Syria. So when we are talking about whether post-privacy is reasonable or not, we're talking about societies where people are free to express opinions and that's kind, that kind of stuff. So uh, don't apply that to people living in oppress under oppressive governments because then bad things are going to happen. Also, uh, this isn't the binary switch. I'm not going to talk to you here and uh, blow your mind, and uh, from now on, you're just going to laugh at privacy because it's a social process. It's a process of, of change, I believe. And uh, so take everything I say here with a grain of salt. It's not this one thing that I tell you and that will change your life forever. Um, some people might have heard the term post-privacy, so before we start to really dive into the topic, I want to attack some of the straw men that usually go around because uh, there are some very vocal people who speak about it, even though they obviously are not willing to give it proper uh, thought and proper representation. So this is kind of a reset button for all of you who have ever heard something about post-privacy uh, from the contrast standpoint. One of the ideas is that post-privacy people are, are out there to take away your secrets or your privacy because it's, it's there and it's awesome and then people like me, all powerful that I am, come in and take away everything that you love and hold dearly. Uh, that's, uh, p those people also say that it's about banning encryption, that it's about the transparent society where everybody is supposed and has to know everything about all of us, uh, which as everybody who's ever heard a William Shatner album uh, knows, is just too much knowledge. Um, and people think they, whenever they talk to post-privacy or about post-privacy, they say, look, they don't even give out their passwords, so they have something to hide. Ha-ha, we've got them, which is also a bogus argument, as you will see at a later point. So nobody's really taking away anything from you. That's not what we're about. It's also not a conspiracy by Google, Facebook, the NSA, uh, the German Verfassungsschutz, or whoever you want to think about. It's... Um, Nobody in the post-privacy fraction is a friend of the NSA or whatever they are doing. Um, and we're also not out here to lure you into giving your data out there into the internet to be victims of whoever corporation or government uh, you can think of. That's all a representation, a misrepresentation of what people are uh, talking about when they mean post-privacy. But before we can really talk about what post-privacy means, maybe we should uh, look at privacy for a second. So we're all on the same uh, level here. Privacy is uh, key to many debates of our times. Uh, 
I don't want to over exaggerate here, but maybe like half of the talks in this conference deal with privacy in some way, shape or form. When I talk about privacy, I speak on a very high level. I'm speaking about the level where we are, the people, where people interact with each other. I'm not talking about privacy on a technical level, you know, where people try to build protocols, how commu computers interact or uh, encryption technologies. That's it's cool that it's there and we all are obviously building up on that, but that's not really the level I'm focusing on here right now. Um, privacy is considered to be threatened a lot these days and uh, many people sitting in this room or running around here are defending it uh, at conferences like these or in, in other situations. It is obviously a human right. It's uh, written down in the Charta of Human Rights that the UN has given out and, for example, the European Union. Okay and the European Union as well. Um, every human being has a reasonable, has an ex, uh, can expect a reasonable amount of privacy, whatever that means, and whoever is supposed to decide what reasonable means in this context. But what is privacy? Apart from obviously a mechanism that we have invented, uh, a tool to protect people from, for example, discrimination or powerful entities that could overwhelm them or could force them to do things they don't want to have done to them. The definition of privacy is, there isn't one, but there are, I'm gonna look at two of the main aspects that define what most people probably understand um, as privacy. There are always some defini definitions that are out there or that try to phrase it somewhat differently. Also, there are slightly different representations. I just picked two at random, s somewhat random. Um, so let's go through that. The first, aspect of privacy is uh, has been formulated in 1870 I think 1890 1890, 1890 by uh, two uh, lawyers uh, Brandeis and Warren this is mr. Brandeis right there Louis Brandeis who later became I think a judge at the US at some high US court um, and that was the time when cameras photographic cameras started popping up and people started to get worries about worried about others you know peeking in and taking photos and you could never be sure that nobody would take a photo while you were somewhere where you weren't supposed to be um, might remind a few people of the debates around Google Glass that we have been having uh, lately and um, Brandis and Warren defined a right not to be seen the implication is that you have the right to retract to a space where nobody looks at you, where you can pull back from the public eye, where you can be whatever you want to be, with whoever you want to be, talk about whatever you want to be, that is basically sacred. Um, obviously, those, that right is connected to things like the privacy of correspondence, of your mail, and also has been adapted to many uh, electronic ways of communication. So it's basically the right of the individual not to be part of the public life for a certain amount of time, and if he or she wants for basically ever if he or she can do that. The second aspect of privacy, um, and here I'm using a, a sentence that James H. Moore, who's a professor for intellectual and moral philosophy at Dartmouth College uh, said, the, the right to control access to personal information. So there is some sort of personal information and we all know what that is. It might be your address, your, your emails, your Facebook relationship status, uh, whatever you can think about, uh, that stuff that data stuff that is out there about you, that somehow concerns you in some way. And this, the idea is that if it is about you in some way, you have the right to decide who is allowed to access it and for which purposes. So uh, if you put a photo of yourself out there, you can decide that only half of your friends are allowed to see it and they may not copy it and they may not print it and don't, are not allowed to put like a mustache on you or something. Um, and the, in the legal kind of way. Obviously, we can't really enforce that because if they don't show it to anyone, we never know that they drew something on our face. What privacy isn't, obviously it's not lupus, but um, <laughs> apart from that, what, privacy is not secrets. Um, secrets are things that you have with other, others, um, things that either you do not share at all, like your passwords, which are your own secret that nobody else has because you use it for authentication or something or is information that you share with a very selected few under the assumption of non-leakage. It's a thing of trust. You establish, you know, these are my friends, I trust them, I can tell them this without them going all over town and telling everyone else. Um, that is not about privacy, but basically a form of, of uh, 
contract based on trust. It's the opposite of privacy, basically, because privacy gives you a right, nothing you have to bargain for, nothing you have to haggle about. Privacy is your right, no matter what. And privacy is about data explicitly known by others. Privacy allows you to control data that you put out there that you can say not everybody is supposed to use in any way they can think of. Secrets are something you don't actually put out there. So it's a slightly different thing, even though it's obviously in some parts related. The for first aspect of privacy um, allows you to have secrets, obviously, because they also are a way to retract from the public uh, view, because you're not t saying everything that comes into your mind most of the time, probably. Um, also something that we have to realize, even though it doesn't really change a lot, it's not a force of nature. Privacy is a social construct that we came up with. The first legal thing came up in 1870, um, and mankind hasn't always been uh, focused on this idea. Think of, for example, uh, the Romans. They had slaves and they had sex in front of their slaves. They didn't care. They even had sex in front of each other. They didn't have this idea of privacy that we have. It's a very new, a very recent invention. That doesn't make it any, any less valuable or, or worse than anything. Most of the cool things in this life are social con uh, constructs. It's just something that we should realize when thinking about uh, how to deal with it. So um, history has given us many, many examples uh, for the importance of privacy. Um, and you can see them all over the planet. Obviously, I know the German ones best, so I probably uh, point at most of the German ones here. Uh, when looking at what privacy means today and how we should see it today in this digital age, we should look back at history to see what, which events or which things formed our idea and our concept of privacy to understand better what it really means and what we want to achieve with it. Um, so these are two very German uh, examples. I said the only good thing coming from Germany was Club Mate. Um, the uh, left yeah, the left picture from you is the uh, Nazi, some Nazi thing. Uh, the Nazis were, uh, in spite of what Indiana Jones movies tell you, not stupid. Um, they used basically every tool they could find to reach their goals. Um, they professionalized psychology, for example, to an immense amount, where they try to find new ways to influence people, to control people through psychological matters in a way that was uh, more professional than anyone had ever done it before. Um, they did a lot of medical research and they used every technology they could find. For, in, in Germany they basically uh, rounded up uh, people they didn't like, Jews, gays, uh, basically whoever said Nazis suck. and. Um, took them away. When Germany attacked the Netherlands and took over, the Netherlands always had a very strong uh, public register of people. It, it's useful for a government to know where people live, you know, you, it's data that you can use to m make decisions on. The Netherlands had a flag in there that marked your religion. When the Nazis take over, this flag uh, religion becomes very, very dangerous and deadly because it, mates, it made it very easy for uh, all the uh, Netherlands Jews to be rounded up and deported. And most of them, well, not most of them, but many of them killed. And um, so this is, in Germany, you cannot think of anything Germans ever do without thinking about that part of history. This has influenced many of the, of the ideas of how we think about privacy. We always have this data can kill thing in, our, in the back of our head because we might know people that lived then. My, my grandparents lived at that point. Um, and that influenced uh, the, the European perception because the German perception obviously influenced the European perception a lot. Um, the right example is uh, the logo of the Stasi, the uh, Staatssicherheit in the Ge uh, federal, no, in the German Democratic Republic, East Germany. The Stasi was a very, uh, they, were, they used technology obviously to spy on people and they used people to spy on people. They plotted people against each other to, to inform on each other. Um, and they, gotten, um, if you heard the talk of Thomas Drake earlier, he talked about the huge archive that he saw, where they basically noted down everything, whoever talked to whom, who had an affair with whom, people who didn't matter to anyone, you know, they're just, she's selling stuff and he's repairing cars and uh, they had an affair so it's noted down there. Um, these days you can look at your file um, and it's, it's grotesque what they noted down. So uh, we obviously have more examples of that kind all over the planet. So we, we see, we've seen what, what governments can do when they get data. And the, 
So we, especially in the European tradition, privacy has always been um, a lot about defending the individual against a government that might uh, overreach its legitimate purpose. Um, when we thought about those privacy rules of, and how we should uh, write them into law, the only entities that could effectively use data were the government itself, because they had the resources to have like people sift through stuff, or they had computers very early on. Um, the military, because they also had the computers, and banks and insurances and a few companies. This picture actually is of uh, Volkswagen, who had computers very early on, even though they didn't really look at the data from uh, people mostly, but they used it the to uh, build new cars. Um, in order to protect against these data powerful or data capable, the government and also big corporations, I mean, a bank or insurance can really ruin your day if they you know, don't give you a loan when you, want to, when you need to pay your rent or when you buy, uh, want to buy a house. Um, we decided to push back and build, very, especially in Europe, very strong privacy laws that allowed the individual to establish control and to get data potentially removed from the public record or from databases. Um, or even to make sure that it's not gathered. So uh, that is an example of how the past influenced how we think about privacy a lot. Privacy is also something that uh, in the past and in philosophical, uh, philosophers' discussions always has been uh, thought of something that allows us to think freely. Because if we're sitting there alone like this awesome monkey, I like monkeys by the way, so there's gonna be a few more monkey pictures coming. Um, if we sit there like that, um, our first ideas tend to suck because, you know, they are just this spark of an idea and we have to work on them to make them good. And many people feel threatened if they utter the first ideas because others will shoot them down because they are not yet fully developed. And uh, the, uh, the common sense is that we need this room of privacy to draw back, develop our ideas up to a point where we can present them to the world and then we step out there, we publish them and we enter a, a fruitful debate. So privacy is supposed to protect not only our data or, but also one of uh, a requirement for free thinking in, in many people's minds. Uh, and finally, privacy and the privacy laws and rules, I mean social rules are also uh, have a lot to do with privacy, shape what is possible to, what you're possible to debate and what not. To, that's neither good or bad, it just shows how strong these ideas, such as privacy codified in law or social norms, can be. Um, if something is marked as private, that also influences whether you can just talk about it like that. Um, for example, in, in societies where income is considered private, you don't ask people what they make because it would be considered overreaching, it would be considered intrusion into their privacy. In societies where nobody cares because it's maybe a, 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 an open record and everybody can see it. You can talk about income because everybody knows anyways. So privacy was very useful in, uh, in describing what's possible to talk about and what isn't in our society. It's also, it shows what we consider to be okay to just mention. So privacy as an idea is great and uh, important and powerful as we've seen and it helps us, it protects us against powerful entities. Um, is privacy a success? Let's look at a few examples. I mean, the European politicians that I have to deal with a lot uh, always want to tell us privacy is going to be the biggest business opportunity for Europe because strong privacy laws and everybody's going to put their data into European servers because there is privacy and, well, facts don't really line up with that, but at least it's something they can tell newspapers. So let's look at whether privacy laws and legislation really works. Um, sometimes it really does. This is the uh, Federal Constitutional Court of Germany, kind of like the, uh, the uh, highest court in the, uh, the uh, US. The Supreme Court, exactly. Thank you. Wisdom of the crowd. Um, in uh, 1983, German government wanted to run a census. And instead of just asking you know, how many people are living in your, uh, in your household, maybe a rough estimate of income, they really started to dive in. It was obscene at that time. It was like maybe a quarter of what Facebook wants to know from you. So it was obscenely much. Nobody could ever think about publishing that much or giving that much information out. And people protested. You know, some people were just refusing to answer that and some people went a step further and sued the German government and said no. And they even got a new right. The, uh, the highest German court said yes, 
and you have the right of informational self-determination, it's called. And in Germany, the legal system is a little different than here. If the court says that that is a right, you can sue for that. That means it's now, they even strengthened it. So the privacy re regulation gave you even more handle to deal with powerful entities. So privacy law worked. But very often it doesn't, sadly. Um, regardless of privacy law, we share stuff left and right without often looking whether the people that it concerns agree to us sharing that. You know, we just take a picture somewhere and we upload it because we think it's cool, but someone's face is on there and that pe person might not like that. Um, Companies can pressure you into giving them data. If you, if you want to get a job with a company, they send you a questionnaire and you either fill it out or you have no job with that company. Um, they have the resources to gather all kinds of data. And just because they're um, very big, they have a lot of data. For example, if you are IBM or if you're Volkswagen, you know exactly how much an hour of work in Germany is worth at any given place. Just because you have all that data, you pay people who live in Germany. Um, also, oftentimes corporations have special legal rights. Uh, in Germany, the, uh, the publishers of newspapers, have, they may uh, trade personal data without any restriction because and, uh, pff, nobody knows, but they have that right. Um, and, so and governments really don't care about privacy laws that much either. They should, but when they start getting in the way, there's always a loophole or a way to circumvent it, or it's just, you know, oops. Um, and this lead, uh, leads us to a short intermission, very quick intermission, because I promise whenever I have a microphone in front of me, I say this. Um, governments, the, the way governments use secret services is toxic for our democracies, and we need to get rid of all of them, of the NSA, of the GCHQ, German BND, all of them, because we can't control them democratically. They do whatever the fuck they want. They care about none of our rights, and they are leading a secret war against all human beings on this planet, and we can no longer tolerate this. And this is not something that we fight with technology, just with technology. It is something political, and we have to get people to understand that this is no longer tolerable, and that is not how our democracies work, and we need to dismantle them, all of them. Thank you. So, let's get back to the privacy issue, um, but dismantle all secret services. Um, back to the privacy issue. Um, so, even if privacy has problems, I mean, everything has problems. If we build it, it has bugs. Why, why break things further and start thinking about post-privacy? Maybe we can fix it. Maybe there's, you know, technology we can throw in there. Maybe we can encrypt the encryption with encryption and encrypt it even further, and then it works. Or maybe we can just, we need to just rephrase the law and then it works for some way. Um, privacy is a human right after all, so who would even attack that? It's at least something. It gives us at least some protection. Um, so let's look at how it's really broken, apart from a few implementation details or, you know, cases where something didn't work out. Um, the awesome Johannes Grenzfurtner of Monochrome, who's talking an, on Sunday at 1 p.m., and you should be there. That dude is awesome. Listen to him. It's going to be basically insulting the public audience here, and it's going to be splendid. So be there. Um, and they coined the monochrome, this artist collective from uh, Austria, coined the term privacy as a bourgeois fantasy. And what that means is, think of, of Brandeis, the right to be let alone, the, light, the right to draw back from the public and no longer participate because, you know, you don't have to. Um, that makes sense if you are, for example, independently wealthy and independent of others. If you have, for example, a room that you can't draw back to. If you share a room with three people because that's all you can afford, no, you have no room to draw back to because there's always two people in that room and they might be doing whatever. Um, if you're not independently wealthy and you need to get a job, I said that earlier, people will send you questionnaires. You want to find an apartment, they send you questionnaires. If the government wants to know something of you, they have these dudes with the uniforms and you know the guns they get you to, get the, uh, to give them that information. If you need a loan, and most people of us will never, will need a loan if we want to buy a car, uh, an apartment, maybe a house. Um, we basically have to strip down and give the bank whatever they need because if we don't, they don't give us any money and we're screwed. So uh, this whole notion of privacy is fine, but you have to be able to afford it, and most people really don't. I don't know how many people here never had to fill out a questionnaire that they don't want to fill out. Very few, I suppose. And then there's something called the privacy paradox. 
Um, it's, it has been described as the discrepancy between privacy concerns and actual privacy settings. There have been many studies about it and you know, tests how it really informs people's decisions. What it means is that people say that they care about privacy and dangers to their privacy. And every, whenever you ask people, they will say they care and it's very important to them, uh, but they don't act like it. They don't set up their privacy settings in that way. Uh, they don't choose the services they use based on that. Um, and especially in Germany, but probably here as well, Facebook ba and Google basically have the worst privacy PR that you can ever have. If Google does anything, everybody believes, okay, they are screwing with our privacy. That's what they do all day. Still, in Germany, Google's search engine has a market penetration of 95% about that. So people say, yes, I feel threatened and endangered, but they still use it. The common wisdom, especially in this kind of crowd, is that people are stupid. And it's complex, yes, and they are not doing all the lag work, and they're not trying to understand it. We have to teach them and you know, beat them with a stick until they do whatever the hell it is that we think they should be doing. The other interpretation is that privacy is, is learned. You know, when I grew up, I learned that privacy is very important for all the reasons I outlined earlier. Um, and I always repeated that for a very long time, even at points where I had realized that something was fishy about that. It's something that has just been repeated so much. It's a meme that we've learned. And it's for most, for many people, no longer that internalized that it's really forming the way we make decisions. The privacy paradox illustrates a point of fundamental change in the way we deal with the world. The old, we have old values like such as privacy, and they are still very deeply rooted in our common, you know, debates. But within the digital world and the way we do things there. They no longer seem to really apply or work the way they used to before. So something has obviously changed. And also something that, that is some, where it really clicked for me. Privacy is DRM. Um, because that is what this, the right to control of access means. It means that you put something out there and you decide what other people can do with it. That is what Sony wanted to do for a long time. They wanted to give you, for example, a CD with a video game. And they said, yes, you can play this, but you cannot copy it. That worked out really well, especially for music and movies that nobody ever could, could copy, even if it wasn't illegal. So uh, if Sony couldn't pay people to make it work, I don't think that it's a reasonable approach that we believe that we can make it work, um, especially given that we know that people break those laws when it's convenient or useful to them. Um, and even if we find tiny pockets where we can get that done, where we can build strong encryption, where certain people that are able to have these, these Cthulhu-esque incantations, that is GPG, uh, who can use that, are protected. Is that our goal, that a few people that, that out-nerd the nerds can really have privacy? I don't think that that is what we consider privacy to be. We want privacy to protect especially those who have maybe less skill uh, or who are more in danger of those things. So uh, just fixing the issue for us and our pals doesn't sound like a reasonable approach to me. Privacy is broken because supporters don't seem to accept trade-offs, oftentimes. Now you might say this is a strawman argument by me, but bear with me for a second. There is a very dogmatic view of privacy. Privacy needs to protect it at all costs because it's the key value for everything, you know, our freedom of whatever stuff. But every human right that we have, and we have quite a lot of them actually, even though most governments seem to have forgotten that, um, they all compete against each other. We all know that if we want to, for example, find a doctor to do some body modding to us, it's very hard to find one who really does what we want to do, even if we consent, because there are strong laws that protect bodies from you know, harm. And they start to fire back when we want to express ourselves by having weird things done to us. Well, weird in a good weird way, maybe, but it's, things clash. We have debates around abortion, whether that is a right of the woman or whether it's not. Obviously, it is, but... Um, uh, there is a debate going on about that, and again, rights are clashing. And the same thing is there with uh, free speech versus privacy. We can always say, yeah, privacy, privacy, uber alles, but uh, that does really step on the free, uh, free speech thing. And we have tilted the debate very much towards the privacy angle, and that can go very horribly wrong. I don't know how many people of you have seen the uh, European court decision lately, the right to be forgotten. Uh, which is basically a, a whole clusterfuck I could rant about for an hour here. But 
they did exactly that. They they wrote in the in the uh, in the uh, in their their description of their decision. Yes, privacy is more important than all the other rights. That means the right to be forgotten has to be implemented. And now certain <coughs> Nazi organizations are are uh, getting things. Uh, deleted from the Google index so people can no longer find that some guy is basically a Nazi. That is probably not what we want as a society. Um, and finally, there are many definitions in the whole area of privacy, very broken or at least wonky. Um, we've kn we know that they often have a lot to do with personal data or personal information and you know the right, right to control that. But what exactly is personal data? Um, we can perceive it as our digital shadow that kind of looks like us, but not really, and doesn't really have all the facets that we have, and that might also be a little you know, tilted or distorted. But still, it can be used to categorize us. It can predict behavior. But we think about uh, our personal data and the meaning of you know, our, our telephone number or uh, our pictures, but what's with connection data? What's with, with the data that me and some other guy are friends? Who, who does that kind of data belong to? Because it, it's not just me. And what's if someone says something about that relationship? If we say we are friends and another person says, I don't like that, then suddenly that I don't like that only makes sense in connection with data of other people and it get, gets very wobbly. Who really is supposed to have control about that? Am I allowed to delete that even though other people might have a reasonable expectancy of that to, to stay there because they are part of that relationship as well. In our focus of, of, uh, on privacy and hiding information, we have kind of ignored that every piece of, of personal information we put out there, out there in, on the internet and out there in the world, um, is also a way to connect, to be discoverable by others. Because that's really what the beauty of the internet is, to find people no longer, this are the people in my, in my city that I can talk to and the rest don't know. I can find people who are really interesting to me, who maybe share the same beliefs or who are just smarter than the people in the city I live in, or um, who are just more intense about some topic that I'm intense about than anyone out there that I can meet in, in the physical space. And all those, um, we can only connect if we make ourselves connectable in a reasonable way. And we kind of sacrificed that connection part in the past when we really couldn't gain anything from that data. The only people that had the resources to use that kind of data were you know, the governments, corporations that could use it. But these days, um, we have this immense processing power in our pocket and we have all these services that we can use that allow us to connect and find people. Um, so the price for being disconnected, get, it's, it's getting higher and higher. And obviously, some people are no longer willing to pay it as gladly as they used to pay it when it really had no benefit at all to you know, put data out there because you couldn't use it in any way. We lose social benefits for us as individuals, economic benefits and may, many other benefits that we could have if we were connectable. So in comes the idea of post-privacy and yes, that is uh, basically a pun in, uh, in image form uh, because I'm setting the post-privacy. You can judge me for including a pun in this uh, presentation. Um, so what is post-privacy? Mm, it's sort of an analysis as well as a utopian approach, but most basic on a pragmatic layer, it means a change of defaults. It means that instead of the default being secret and hidden, um, the digital world seems to work better when we try to reap the gains of cooperation and only decide to keep selected things hidden. So. We publish more of us uh, explicitly. Um, and we just decide now this is something that I might not want to put out there. That is the very 10,000 feet view of post-privacy. <coughs> when we look at the analysis part, then it's basically the acknowledgement of a problem. We see that privacy doesn't seem to be working all that well, because we wouldn't have all these discussions if it was really working. Um, states really only care about it when it suits their needs, as I said. Uh, especially when we see right now there's a very strong rhetoric in the uh, European Union and uh, in Germany against the NSA spying and obviously then the US as well. Uh, there's actually reason supposedly reasonable people are talking about building a parallel European internet as if that would solve anything with the GCHQ and the German BND that is basically storing all the data as well. Um, but it's sort of 
now the government says, yes, we can use that as a political lever against for U.S. Uh, companies, and we use it to support our local economy. But they don't care about privacy at all when it comes to we need to collect data for whatever uh, their goal is. Corporations, obviously, don't care about privacy laws because they have all these uh, resources to gather data from either us because we need user services, because they can uh, connect to publicly available sources and integrate that into the data cloud. And uh, they just have data because they're very big and just that, that just creates data for them magically. They know prices of things. They know um, what people put up with in certain areas of the world just because they've tried to push them as far as they can because that's what corporations do. And we, all of us, we break it every day. There are say, uh, pages like Facebook, for example, where people just screenshot people's Facebook posts that they consider to be stupid. And many of them are stupid, but those people never said, yes, publish this, uh, even if the name has been anonymized, which tends not to work because they use the standard blur algorithm that can be unblurred quite effectively. Um, and uh, oftentimes we just, you know, we just want to share a, a photo or something and we never think about whether Cindy or Carl wanted to be tagged there and then they complain about it but somebody else already took a picture or a screenshot of it and, you know, things are very broken in that land. And more fundamental is that even th though the, the term social networks has been, become synonymous with a certain class of, of online services and products like Facebooks or whatever, We've always had them, and we've always lived in them. And interestingly, offline, we do share all kinds of information that we probably wouldn't share online. Or if we thought about it in an online context, we would never do that out of our free will. Um, I grew up in a very tiny village, about 2,000 people, and 1,000 of them were cows. So tiny village. Um, and everybody there knew basically everything about everyone because you just knew okay that guy's car hasn't driven to work for like four weeks now he doesn't have that much holidays so probably he lost his job um, you knew who, which people had an affair because you can't hide that in this tiny space because people are living together and interacting with each other um, we're not an island nobody of us is autonomous really not and that is not a weakness um, the fact that we're connected and that we're working together and that we're sharing this, this information make us as coverable in whatever we can do or what we like to do uh, is a strength. That is, that is what allows us division of labor. That is what allows us to really have freedom. Because if we start thinking of us as, as these autonomous things, and you know, we learn to bake our own bread, make our own t-shirts, uh, code our own operating system because who trusts the things anyways, build our own computers, we'll never get anything real done. And Actually, I don't want to make my own t-shirts. I want to focus on things that I'm good at and that I like. And I want other people to focus on the things that they're good at and that they like. Um, and that is only possible if we share information about each other, about how we can relate to each other, what we can do for each other. And that is something that in the offline space we've always done automatically. Even sometimes uh, it was just there because we're moving in the same space, in the same physical space where we could see each other. Um, um, and we, for example, clothing that we see communicates a lot about us um, and we use that information to, you know, decide who to talk to. Oh, that's a cool band shirt. I'm going to talk to that dude and not the guy in the suit, for example, or the girl in the suit. Um, and in the, in the fight for online privacy, we have started to make connecting harder. And that sounds like a very stupid strategy for us, very powerless individuals. I mean, you are probably more powerful than I am, but I'm just this random dude from Germany. Um, if I want to be heard and if I, if I want to influence the world in any way, if I want to nudge it just a little bit in the right direction, I need to connect to other people because I, I can't do it. Really, I can't. And maybe you can, I can't. Um, privacy is also kind of a Judas. It's not just that, oh, sadly, it's not working, but it would be that great of an idea. It's a two-sided sword that can also cut you. Um, it's kind of like the, there's this ideology that you need to buy your own house. And many people think that has a lot to do with, you know, you need to give people freedom. Yeah. Buy your own house so you're independent of everyone. But the ideology basically comes from uh, the British capitalists who thought, okay, if I have all these people working for me and they go really into debt when they buy their house, they will no longer protest when I do something to them because they need that job to pay their mortgage. Uh, and privacy kind of has uh, the same impetus. And I want to give another example from the Germanish area, back then there wasn't a Germany, but from that area. 
this is the family, uh, the family of the painter Carl Begas. Uh, this thing was drawn in 1808. And it's one of the early examples of privacy. And it's the so-called Biedermeier area. It, was, it had, had its, its hay time in 18, between 1850 and 18, 18, 1815 and 1850. And it was a reaction to the Carlsbad decrees that the, uh, where the German uh, monarchy decided that all these reformist, liberal ideas, you know, people thinking about nation states and people having rights and voting and all those crazy ideas uh, were not so cool. So the Carlsbad decrees made it uh, yeah, so basically it illegal to say your, your opinion out in public. It censored the press. It uh, banned liberal professors from working at un universities. It um, disbanded all liberal organizations that pushed for some sort of political change. Um, and many of the reformers and local governments that had worked with different groups uh, were pushed out of office by about 1820. By uh, 1820, all significant German reform movement was dead, completely dead by a few of those laws. Um, and that lead, uh, led to, uh, to the elite that could afford it to pull back to their private lives. Back then, it was really called that, into the private lives. It was the time where the bourgeoisie uh, started cultivating their private home life. You know, you decorated your house very nicely. Um, you had paintings over there, and you had this, you know, your living room was important, and you um, invited various, your friends to, to events there. But it was all in this, in this very secluded area. Not every part of your house was something that friends could see, only very selected areas where you could show how awesome your house was. Um, this nice home was the goal. Your private life that, you know, you and your family interacted on, that was supposed to be beautiful and people invested a lot of money and work into that. And that made basically women and children invisible and political debate also because political debate happened, you know, in people's homes, but it never left it. You invited three friends and you discussed, yes, the king, what an ass hat, but nobody talked about it. Um, the women were reduced to basically taking care of the children. The, the husband of the household would represent the family to the outside whenever that was really necessary. Um, the children didn't really have anything to do with the other children as well. You had maybe someone taking care of them uh, to support the, wo the woman of their house, but uh, basically everyone was made invisible and everybody pulled back who could uh, just to protect themselves because whenever you said something out there, you would get screwed. Um, it was basically the the idea of don't ask, don't tell, times 100. You could think whatever you wanted to, but as soon as you spoke out, off with his head. Not off with his head, really, uh, but uh, they had more efficient technologies, but basically that was it. Um, and we have so many examples in, in history about people being courageous and changing the status quo, but they never happened in the back door, uh, in the back room of some person's house. Maybe they first started there, people started talking about ideas and gathering, but to really change the public perception, you have to move out there, you have to be visible, you have to make a statement. Um, our democracies need that kind of input. Think of, for example, Rosa Parks. If she just had sit, uh, stayed at home and said, yes, I should be able to sit anywhere, that wouldn't have worked. She needed to make that, that public statement that people couldn't ignore that was out there. It was a data point that she generated, the data point that people can sit there, and that was something that people could aggregate around. Today, that would have been a hashtag. Uh, but hashtags do exactly that. They, they give you uh, a point that you can relate to, that you can connect with on, for example, an issue. Um, in Germany, uh, in, in Germany, yes. Uh, in New York, you have this Christopher Street, which is a symbol for, for gays being visible. It, it is a symbol for, no, we're no longer invisible and we're no longer happy with doing whatever it is we want to do at home. We're, we're part of society and we want to be visible and we want to speak for our, on our behalf and we want our rights to be respected. So significant reform doesn't happen in private. And it might start like that, but we need, really need to find ways to allow people to do that in public. And that is where the utopian post-privacy approach comes in. The, the question is, how should a world work where we use our connectedness as individuals to, and the way we can decentralize, for example, debates or, or distribution of power to fight discrimination and abuse of power by powerful entities? Um, how can we build a world in where we make visible what's really out there? 
and not make people invisible and their needs invisible, because that's a very, very, uh, a very important thing to keep discrimination intact. We see that a lot when we talk about, for example, how movies show the world, where everybody's white, and most of the people acting are also men. That makes people invisible that are not white and not men. And we need to build a world where people are visible. And that means the data of them is out there. So how can we build a world where those people don't run the danger of having, uh, of having uh, trampled uh, on their rights? So we need to rethink the way our rules work, our laws work, our regulations work, and to, to stop fetishizing privacy as though it was the, the best thing ever happened and this, uh, this one solution to everything we ever had. Privacy for its own sake is really it leads to bullshit claims. I uh, don't know if you remember um, when, when Street View launched in Germany, people went apeshit because people were taking pictures of houses with blurred faces and blurred ID, whatever, but pictures of houses. And Germans were, they were angry and uh, they protested. And they protested in the form that they went to newspapers and said, we don't want Google to take a picture of our photo. And they lined up, all people on the, from the household lined up in front of their house with their names written underneath the picture in the paper, on the website of the paper, because no, nobody's supposed to take a picture of our house. That is, has something to do with the fetishization of privacy, with, with a bullshit claim that is somehow tied to a feeling of privacy that isn't really there and isn't really reasonable. We can talk about whether it's okay that people just drive through, through, uh, through streets and take pictures. We have to discuss if that is the right of everyone, and if, it, if it's not, legally it is their right, even in Germany. But Fetishizing privacy leads just to bad decisions. Um, how can we build a world that allows us as individuals and every individual to reap the benefits of, of being networked, of collaborating with people all over the planet? Um, and that has a lot to do with the, the ideas of participation and giving access. It has to do with people having the right to be connected. It has a lot to do with people having the right to have access to technology and have maybe even access to, to a computer just as a human right. Um, can we subvert established class and social structures by giving people more participation? Um, we've heard the term knowledge is power here a few times in, in different talks already, but knowledge is actually power when you think about it as social capital. Social capital means that you come from a certain social class um, and you know how that class acts. If you grow up rich, you know how rich people act, how they interact with each other how they build networks. You know how to move in a crowd of rich people. If you come, like me, from a household of, of working people, um, that is a really hard thing to learn. I still don't know how to dress properly, obviously. Um, and this idea of social capital, of knowing how to dress, is, um, and dressing is just one part, it's the way how you phrase things, is really important. And the, how can we give access to that to more people? Because that can help us to, to change and break up existing social structures that keep people who have always been, been down, down. And that is obviously not the world that we want to live in. Um, how can we, in this world where there's so much data is out there, how can we protect people from discrimination? Because obviously, if data is out there, it could be used for, to discriminate against them. How can we make sure that the data is not misused by the powerful? Um, how can we embrace decentralization even more? All those are are things that people working on post-privacy have different answers to because it's not really this one solution. It's not, you know, here, this is the box post-privacy, put it into a society and it works. But it's an ongoing debate that I invite you all to, to participate in if you want to. It's Post-privacy is, even if you don't want to, want to adapt it, it's a way to reset your thinking in a way, to step back from whatever it is that we hold dear as dogma or as, uh, as a fetish and say, okay, how, what's really there and what can we do with it and what we, do we want it to do. We need to get out of this, this, this dead end of the over-reliance on privacy. That um, Privacy isn't dead. That's it's really not the point and I'm not here to declare that it's dead. The question is, if privacy isn't the silver bullet that we thought it was, uh, what, what can we save from, from it? What can we change from it to uh, build a new world? And building just uh, this digital uh, life into a libertarian objectivist thing obviously can't be a solution because that is basically the stupidest thing anyone can ever do. So we need the few following things. Uh, we need to have to talk about 
participation. How can we make sure that every individual that wants to be connected is connected and can benefit? Um, how can we help people contribute and how can we help people really reap benefits from all that? Just dumping GPG code out there helps no one, that's bullshit. Um, in German, for example, income is deeply private. You don't talk about that. And this leads to young people. And I have to I deal with them all, every day with students who are just finishing their degrees. Um, I deal with them, and they don't know how much money they should, uh, they should ask for when they apply for a job after their master's. Because nobody talks about money. I didn't know what my father made uh, until I was about 25, because I never asked, because it would have been considered impolite. Uh, other countries have obviously open registers where that is not, not an issue, but uh, we need to, to help people get participation and get access to their data in a form that they can use and that they can apply to their lives and to, to uh, be better. We have to build open and non-commercial platforms for people to collect and aggregate data because if we don't, nobody will. Facebook wants to have their silo because that's how their business works. Uh, we have to build something that works as a replacement or in a connection with Facebook. Maybe people will never leave Facebook, but maybe we should build ways where they can at least have their data mirrored so they can access it in a more meaningful way than what Facebook allows them. Um, we need to fix the way we think about, about software and build usable alternatives that empower the use of data and not these di diaspora things where you can not find people and only if you, and nothing works and you can't communicate through it and it's just broken. That doesn't help anyone. We, we shouldn't focus on hiding information. We should focus on empowering people with information because that's what the information age is about, if it is about anything. Um, we have to build structures that help us to collectively redistribute power. We, right now we are building just, instead of governments, we're building these huge power structures like Google, Facebook, those companies. Um, how can we find ways to re redistribute power? One, another thing is, for example, genome data. If you want to do health uh, research, you basically have to be part of a big company because it's really expensive to get that kind of data, to get access to, to genomes. Um, is that how we want the world to work? Because right now we have to rely on a few pharmaceutical companies to do research. And if, they don't, if they're not interested in something, if it's not worth it because it's in Africa and they don't have the money to pay for anything anyways, they will not work on it. There are, there are, there are opinions, uh, opinions, there are options to fight that. For example, um, some people might know the 23andMe service where you can have your genome ana analyzed. A friend of mine built OpenSMP where you can upload your thing and give it access to, uh, to um, researchers to study and to, to check whether the companies that are building our, our medicine are really doing a good job or whether they are just selling us shit. We have to build platforms that allow us to harness data. And that doesn't mean that you have to link your OpenSMP account to all your other accounts so everybody knows that it's your data, but it's providing that kind of information can help us all because it allows us all to access more information. We have to look at consent and rethink consent, on, especially on a very individual level. Um, we can obviously just take a picture of this, and, and I was tempted to just take a picture of this room because it's, for me it's kind of a big deal to stand here. But then I thought, okay, there are probably a bunch of people who don't want their picture taken right now, so don't. Um, and that is a way we have to rethink how we act with the world, think more about consent, think more about how we really treat other people and other people's data with respect, with the respect they deserve. Ask how they, thank you, ask how they uh, want their data to be treated. So we need to further develop the ethics of sharing what's okay and what's not okay, rethink that. Uh, lobbying privacy laws, we have basically been missing the point because what we really want to do is we want to protect people from overreach and discrimination. And what we have been doing is we have focused on this one tool and we've tried patching it and, and fixing it and patching it and fixing it instead of really looking at the issue and seeing if the tool is, is the right tool anyways. Maybe it's no longer the right tool. Maybe it was, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it no longer works. So we, we kind of fucked up because we, we just, we try to hide a lot of data and we are not focusing on enabling people to do something useful with it. Um, and we ignore people and, and we make fun of people who use Facebook because it's the only thing they have and they know how to use and tell, yeah, if your privacy is fucked well, it's your own fault. Use whatever weird command line thing is out there. That is all, <laughs> we fucked that up. That's our fault and we can do better. And I'm looking forward to seeing what, what you guys and you girls come up with. 
So uh, just to get some nerd cred, the inevitable XKCD comic. Um, privacy is not this binary thing and not this one thing. Many people think very differently about that. And um, this talk is not supposed to convince you all that I'm right and I've just, I've eaten the wisdom with a spoon from childhood on. But I hope to give you just a new way of thinking about things. And maybe you think it's stupid and that's okay if it helps you rethink your your perception of privacy in the digital sphere. Maybe you can come up with something uh, that annihilates everything I said and that works and that would be awesome. But uh, that's everything that I can do. One thing very important to me, a very special thanks goes out, goes out to these people. Kaspar Clemens Mirau, Katrin Passig, Lorena Jean Palassi, Michael Seemann, Till Neuhaus and a few others because without them I couldn't have paid for the flight over here. Uh, they are the most awesome people uh, right now. So uh, thanks to them. Um, <laughs> Their applause. Thank you for your attention and coming here when you could have listened to this awesome Burning Man talk that I will later look at in the recording. Um, <laughs> Questions and remarks, we don't have a lot of time, sorry, I uh, had a lot to talk about. Um, but I'm here all, all weekend, you can just hook me up. I'm the dude with the red star on the shirt. Um, you can also hook me up on Twitter, I'm at Tante. Uh, you can email me or XMPP me at tante at tante.cc and tante.cc is also my website where you can uh, write comments under my post-private blog post telling me how stupid I am. Thank you and uh, have a nice conference. Thank you.